a little bit Star Trek-y because all of a sudden I was being taken back and they were, I was entertaining to them because, you know, they were like, well, you squeeze this thing. And I said, I'm, <laughs> I'm not, no, I buy milk in a store. And uh, um, so they realized I was unfed and untrained and they kind of took me into their community, which was no electricity and, uh, and it was, I became very fascinated with it and proceeded to uh, uh, live with them, which is something that everybody who wanted to do couldn't do. But because I was this good, inept person trying to help, I was taken in. And, you know, if you've ever seen the Harrison Ford movie Witness, you know, without the guns, that was kind of me and these barn raisings and the like. And so it was a fascinating time. And, and that led to uh, some time spent at Oxford and... Uh, studying all kinds of cultures. Um, so I spent some uh, 20 plus years explaining how a social anthropologist ends up running software companies. And I finally come to this conclusion that software is really about changing culture. So the only time it works is if things change, because otherwise you wouldn't use it. And uh, the big challenge of software is always people, um, because they don't want to change, and they don't want to use it. You've got to figure out user interface. So that's about the best I can do. But, um, but it was fascinating to live between Amish people and African tribes and you know, uh, Latin America and a variety of different places where you know, we spent time in, in India. And uh, it, you know, it made for a great basis of dealing with uh, technology cultures along the way. So um, in terms of predictive nature, I'm not sure that was it. But um, you know, being from a family that, that has uh, has uh, generated some entrepreneurs. I can tell you that that the real responsibility there was primarily a mother who never said no to anything anybody wanted to do and was intensely competitive. And there's kind of a famous story. We had six children, and and when you weren't successful, we, she had she was very proud of six six portraits that were right as everybody walked in. They saw her six children. Um, but when you weren't successful at doing something, she would turn your picture around. And uh, people think I'm kidding about this, but this is no joke. And so everybody would come in and they'd say, oh, there's a picture turned around. And she would tell the story of why it was turned around. Either you didn't do well, whether it be a school, an athletic event, whatever it was, you had not been successful. And uh, you lived with that until you did something to it. At times there were two or three turned around. Um, but um, uh, there's, there's a, a story I'll tell since my brother's fond of making fun of me when he has the mic, and that is, uh, um, as Auschwitz was being successful early on, and I was fortunate to be in Time Magazine, and there was a nice write-up about the company, and uh, uh, for a lot of work that other people did, I was pictured. And uh, so this came to the attention of my mother, and so I was talking to her, and she said, uh, I saw that you were in Time Magazine. And she said, I noticed your brother Howard was not. She said, on the other hand, it's not like you were on the cover, so it's really no big deal. <laughs> so so you know, that, kind of a, that kind of abusive environment is what created a series of entrepreneurs. So. Thank you for that story. Jan, you, uh, your, your education didn't, I, I didn't see from that 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 was a straight line to comp score. Uh, what was your, your degree? And it wasn't here. This is uh, no, I, I grew up in, uh, I grew up in the UK, and uh, I have a physics degree undergrad and a master's in marketing. But um, uh, I, I think in a sense it kind of prepared me for what I do because uh, I wasn't good enough, I realized, as I was, um, I was an undergrad school. I wasn't good enough to be that successful in the field of physics. I didn't have a competitive advantage there, but I thought I maybe was able to combine a, a quantitative um, analytical technical ability with a communication ability that I thought I had. And so marketing was a natural thing to be able to, to go off and uh, do my master's in. Um, which, um, you know, which then led me to get offered a job, which brought me to the States. And so it kind of, you know, kind of all worked out. And I think I was, you know, I was fortunate that I did pick the field that I picked. Michael, your trajectory I, I find a little simpler because you were in consulting prior to sure payroll, is that right? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out which of my kids' pictures I should turn around. 
and then, wow, that's pretty good. Uh, yeah, no, I used to make charts for a living, so um, I, I learned how to turn the page horizontally. Uh, and, you know, in some ways it, it is, to me, there, there was a lot of learning in terms of being a consultant and learning to um, you know, have to diagnose so many situations so quickly was very useful. Uh, and I also sort of learned what I really didn't like to do and what I did like to do. Uh, and I like to get involved and get into the detail of making something happen. And as a consultant, while it's a great profession, it just wasn't for me. And so uh, I'm glad I moved in a different direction. Talk about your biggest challenge. What, what's the, uh, the toughest circumstance you've ever had to face in business? Jim? So um, uh, I would say it was when, when, I was, uh, when I was running IRI, and actually goes back to an acquisition, and we were uh, being acquired in a bit. So um, we were competing with uh, the A.C. Nielsen Company um, here in Chicago. They had the time were owned by the Diamond Bradstreet. And um, uh, we were first, uh, IRI was first to introduce a national scanning-based uh, measurement service and uh, started to take some significant market share from uh, A.C. Nielsen. It was a much bigger company than us, but we were attacking one of the, you know, one of the crown jewels and apparently doing it successfully which led to um, an approach from them to buy IRI. And it was a very attractive uh, financial deal, as, as I recall. The numbers, I'll never forget these numbers, it was 60 times earnings and six times revenue. And uh, you know, we were a little concerned as to whether uh, there would be any antitrust issues to deal with. And our law firm, I won't name them, but it was a Chicago firm. Uh, uh, their advice was on this, so this will go through, this won't be a problem. This is, I think this is in the Jim Reagan administration, and no, no deal had been blocked. So this thing is going to sail right through. So we announced the deal, and, uh, and all hell broke loose. And um, what we didn't anticipate, and what we quit the deal, is that the customers didn't like it. And they scurried down to Washington to the FTC and complained about the deal. And, what we learned is that um, deals often um, arouse complaints. But if the FTC gets a complaint from a competitor to one of the companies being acquired, eh, they get a lot of that stuff. But when customers come in and complain, that really complain, that really gets their attention. And so, um, you know, we went through the obligatory three month, I forget, three month period, something like that, where you had to provide a bunch of information, and they uh, had an extension on that, and then. Justice Palmer got involved, and at the end of uh, this period, they announced that if we were uh, going to try to close the deal, they would uh, sue us to stop it. Whereupon DNB just uh, walked away from the deal, leaving us sitting, uh, leaving us sitting there, pretty uh, looking pretty stupid, um, looking more stupid because we thought we were so smart that we had not engaged a banker, because the, the the approach came directly. Uh, from um, one of their directors to one of ours, and then you know, managed to turn the ball and negotiated it. And we had no breakup fee in the deal, to leave on, which is a great lesson. Uh, so, um, so uh, long answer to your, your question, Bob, but what was then really challenging was um, just getting the company back on track, getting the people um, focused. Uh, we were, we had been spending a lot of money um, building a set of new services. And so when the deal was announced, uh, basically the market froze and uh, nobody was really making any buying decision. They tried to really sit back waiting to see what was going to happen with this deal. And so our costs continued ramping, but our revenues just stopped growing. And so our negative cash burn got uh, big uh, pretty fast. And so the, the challenge was, was I guess in all dimensions, it was getting the company back on track, getting it to profitability, getting uh, the employees focused, uh, dealing with uh, clients, uh, trying to explain uh, why we ever thought we would be able to sell a business, et cetera, et cetera. And those were, um, you know, those were pretty, uh, I'd say there was a 18-month uh, period that was pretty, uh, it was pretty difficult, but, um, uh, you know, we, were able to buckle down and focus and actually uh, grow the company back. And we took our stock price over a three-year period from about eight bucks to about 40. 
and uh, that I think was an indication that we were able to to uh, solve the problem. But those were uh, those were pretty uh, pretty wild days. Uh, that was a lot. <laughs> yeah, Michael, biggest challenge? I, I'd say there were, there were a lot of challenges. Uh, I would say, and I almost think in growing a business, it, it's sort of like you you get some momentum and you get up the hill and you start growing. And then in order to make that next hill, you've got to really sort of take a step back, build some infrastructure, make sure you have the ability to scale to that next level. And in any one of those peaks, you can just sort of spiral right down and be done. And so we had lots of those. But I would say the toughest one was just getting that initial momentum to really get going. Uh, Glenn talked about how they started and they wrote the internet up and then they wrote the internet down. So we just wrote it down. Um, we were fundraising on Sand Hill Road in March of 2000. We had very little money. Beginning of the week, everybody would talk to us, and by the end of the week, with the market crashing, we couldn't get an appointment, we flew home early. Uh, and so we had a limited amount of money, and we had to figure out how to get the business going. Our initial funding was stopped, and we had to raise, we had to raise money, but at the same time, we had all this excitement. We had a partnership with Wells Fargo, which was going to transform the business. You had a, a big bank that was going to invest in us and uh, sell our product for us, and yet we weren't sure we could get money on the other end. And so. We ended up getting some VCs, Chicago-based VCs were, were nice enough to commit to us, uh, but they tied us into making sure we got our Wells Fargo deal done, and then Wells Fargo decided they wanted to come in as an investor, so that set everything else back. And so we had this really tight window to get a deal done so we could get funded and grow our business and get some momentum versus going bankrupt. And I'll never forget about 6.30, 7 o'clock, uh, one late November evening, actually about this time of year, uh, with two different sets of lawyers on different lines. One talking about closing the Wells Fargo deal and the other one talking about if we have to go bankrupt, what do we do? Uh, and that was a very, very scary moment. Uh, fortunately, we lived on the right side of that and we went up and, and we had some other issues. Uh, and you know, you just sort of run through those every time. That's a good story. Glenn, are you gonna tell us about a 60% stock drop three board members, a CFO, uh, or you've got other stories? Um, unfortunately, I have a lot of stories, but, but I think what Michael just described is, is in fact, from a leadership perspective, um, what the biggest challenge is. At, at any given time when you're building companies, you have situations where you face just that situation. That is, as, as the CEO and maybe one or two other people in the company, that you say, if this doesn't happen, if that doesn't happen, and this could be a very bad outcome. And it could be a company, a smaller company going out of business. It could be we won't make payroll. You know, we think we're on the verge of a big deal, but if it doesn't happen, it can turn into a terrible situation. Um, and in those kind of situations, you have to have this fine line of one, making sure you can lead and you're not disabled uh, by that. And two, what you say to people, in some cases, these are people who are depending on you. And you know, it's a very tough thing. Sometimes people, I remember, and I'll, I'll uh, kind of transition into that, um, we had kind of a big board showdown earlier in the year. And, and you know, as I was flying to New York for this big uh, classic board meeting, I was walking out and somebody said, hey, we're depending on you. And uh, you know, so you, you carry that for 7,000 people that you know the outcome can be very different for those people if it doesn't go well. And so it becomes about more than just you, but you know, there, there's a great quote, and I, I won't try it because I won't get it right, but it says entrepreneurs are able to you know, have a dual personality at the same time without being crazy, and that is you know, dealing with just the situation that Michael dealt with, which is they're going in and you say either we'll be bankrupt or we'll be really happy. And most people can't, you know, in the same day, deal with those two issues and still conduct the rest of their life, and that's a challenge. Um, you know, relative to being in the public market, and I just, I teach at a few different business schools, but I was, you know, teaching at one recently, and someone asked some, you know, student who should have known better, um, asked that same question. And, uh, um, you know, he said, well, what happened? And I said, look, if you're private, you really desperately want to be public. And if you're public, you really want to be private. And that's just the way the world works. And that varies by time. But, um, you know, we, uh, the company, as I mentioned, Allscript's pretty fascinating history. Um, we took the company public. Um, our stock hit $89 at a time when our loss was the highest loss we ever had in the history of the company. 
uh, close to $300 million. And uh, uh, the day we turned profitable, the stock hit a dollar. We were on the verge of being delisted by NASDAQ. So that was our gift for turning profitable. Um, fast forward, you know, we we're all the way down to a dollar. We built the stock all the way back up. The company's valued once again at three plus billion dollars. And uh, um, we have a series of events that come together coming off of a 2011 that was the most successful in the company's history. So we have uh, a 17% revenue growth, 23% profit growth. The first time we had more than 200 million of operating cash flow. Pretty good time. So good that our CFO, who's been with me nine years, says, you know, for some family reasons, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to retire, you know, get away from the quarter to quarter life, you know, done well, and, you know, give you some time to plan, because after all, it's going to be the best year in our history. Well, that got announced at the same time that a board split got announced, where a few members of the board that had come to us from a merger two years before um, ultimately for a variety of reasons, uh, you know, decided they wanted to take the company in a different direction, and, and there was a, uh, a board split, and this was all played out publicly. So you had a board split, you had three members leaving the board, you had a CFO leaving, which had nothing to do with this, but the market put all of that together, and last but not least, we had a miss on our numbers, which turned out not to be our numbers at all, because the market said, you guys are doing so well, we're going to up your numbers. And of course, unlike in the old days, you can't go to them and say you really shouldn't do that. Um, so those become your numbers whether you like it or not. When you put those three together, we had a 60% stock drop. And you know the issue isn't the stock drop. It's what happens after that, which is customers start to worry. Um, you, know, you have market issues. You invariably get a lawsuit, a stock drop lawsuit, which always gets settled for about a million dollars less than your policy. So, you know, having been through a few of these, so, um, you know, that's the process. And then you have to deal with the aftermath of that. And, uh, you know, uh, we had some investors come and say the company ought to be worth a lot more. You know, well, we, didn't, we weren't the ones selling the stock. So we did, uh, we did a buyback for a few hundred million dollars. And, uh, you know, uh, apparently, from what I read in the papers, people still think we're undervalued. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, we'll see, see what happens. But, uh, uh, but that's, you know, again, another challenge because people look to you and people who are feeling really good um, about their portfolio, about their kids' education and the like, you know, come to you and say, you know, what's going on? Should I buy or sell the stock? You know, what should I, of course, as a CEO, you can't really say much of anything about that. Um, but that's the nature of being public. And it's a challenge. You know, the other reason we talked a little bit about M&A, um, as a public company, if I want to spend $5 million to develop a new product, um, I have to try to convince analysts who have a three to six month window why this is good to spend that money. But if I want to go buy a $50 million company that has that product, it's a non-issue. In fact, $50 million acquisition, maybe, maybe I have to report it, maybe I don't, because given our market cap, it's probably not material. We would report it anyway. But, but so you know, that's the challenge of being public in this kind of environment. Thank you. Questions? Diane? the exits are still there, it might not be um, it might not be as attractive to go public for some of the reasons that Glenn said, and I uh, had my own experiences uh, in running public companies. It's, it's not easy because it, it's, um, what, what I find really the most frustrating aspect of being, of being public, besides all of the, the administrative stuff that, that, that's, that's required today, um, is that 
especially in the, the, the high tech areas where you can get high multiples, you don't control those multiples. And it's very frustrating when you're growing a company at a rapid clip and your stock price drops simply because for some reason the market values the sector that you're in and less than it did three months before. Very frustrating for employees who've been working hard and are motivated to accomplish something with the expectation that the, the, the stock's going to grow. But um, um, so I, I suspect that there are a lot of reasons why going public today isn't as attractive as it might have been um, in, uh, in the past. Uh, but that's not to say that somebody that creates a new company today isn't attractive to somebody else who wants to acquire them. So I think that you know, the whole M&A exit is maybe more attractive and it's likely to be more active uh, 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 an exit avenue than, uh, than IPOs. So I, I don't think, I don't see uh, a sense in, in the tech world that we live in that there's any concern about what the exit strategy uh, is going to be. In fact, if anything, given the multiples that companies are willing to pay, even before a company gets to profitability, no, you can you know walk away with some significant wealth for yourself and the employees, even before you've got to, to positive cash flow results. Because somebody is willing to pay for that technology that you created for you know for the reasons I said earlier that they don't have the time to build the thing themselves, and that asset is worth a lot to them in their you know particular you know particular business. Um, I, just one example, I'll give you uh, what we went through. I think what you asked uh, what you asked me the question about the acquisitions that we had done. Um, the, the first one that we did is a great example of the value of, of a brand. Uh, so uh, there was a company by the name of Media Metrics that was in the business of measuring audiences visiting websites. And in the advertising business, you need a, an independent third party, like a Nielsen for television, Arbitron for radio, or I think CompScore in the case of, uh, of online, that provides data for the agencies to be able to value an audience. So we provide the size of the audience, the demographics, etc. It kind of helps set a price for the buying and selling of, of the, uh, the advertising. Well, the, back in 2001, we had built out a very powerful engine for doing all of this measurement, but there was one established company out there by the name of Media Metrics that had a, they weren't financially successful at that point in time, because they were going through the implosion of the internet and all of that, and all of what was related and then expanded too fast, it was losing money, couldn't raise additional capital, and they were, they were public, it was kind of, uh, kind of over for them. And uh, we were able to buy them for $2 million, all right? And basically it was like buying a Corvette, beautiful outside body, and then you open up the engine, and there's not a Corvette engine in, there's a Chevette engine in. <laughs> and we just took the engine out, threw it away, and put our engine in. And suddenly, our engine, with this Media Metrics brand name, took off in a way that we couldn't when we had our own brand name on it. And that was, a, to me, a great, um, you know, great lesson about you know why do people pay so much money for certain brand names, right? I mean, why did Disney pay? What do they pay for uh, Lucas's company? Four billion dollars, right? Well, if you look at the value of that Star Wars brand name that they will probably continue rolling out, you know, movie after movie after movie after, just like James Bond, the recent, the recent movie, the recent James Bond movie, what, the 40th movie that they produced, right, over a 50 year period, okay, as already, and they released it at the end of October globally, it's already generated over $500 million in revenue, right, um, you know, they had cost, they had produced the movie, but it's the value of that brand name that's, um, you know, it's really driving it, it's a great, Great illustration of sometimes the, the, the what you can pick up in, in some of these trans in some of these uh, transactions. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thoughts on Diane's question about exit? Sure. Easier well, or harder in the future? I, I don't think it's really that different. I think you know even looking around the panel, we, we we like to say we were an overnight success after 11 years, right? So um, it took us a long time to have an exit, and I think. For us, we always focus, and I think people building businesses say, if you focus on building a real business, coming up with a unique technology, a great service model, one that can show a way to profitability or is profitable, 
you'll have all sorts of options in the future, whether that's a public company, whether that's an exit to a strategic, whether that's an investor, et cetera. I think the challenge today is that I think a lot of people want to move at the speed of light to an exit and to being rich. And I just don't think the world is set up that way. And so I think uh, trying to time the markets and building your business for an IPO at X time or building your business to sell to a strategic at Y time is very, very hard to do. And you might get lucky and you might make it. But if you build a real business, I think you'll have all sorts of options. So that's where I see the world. Glenn, uh, time to exit. And I'm, you know, picking up on what Michael said, you know, it, the Instagram example of a year or two to, to winning the lottery is just not the way it usually happens. In your experience, success is that there's an exit of what, five years, 10 years, more? Well, I think it's, uh, it depends what you want to do. I mean, I'm concerned that a lot of our young people come out and they have these enormous expectations that it is a year or two. And, uh, you know, in our, in our venture fund in Seven Wire, we always ask the question, what's your exit strategy? And generally, if they have one, we aren't interested. Um, because we want people to say, I, actually, I love what I'm doing. You know, I just want to build this company. And so having an exit strategy is a challenge because you don't control the exit strategy. Um, so I think, you know, what in my experience it's been, um, you know, it's been one was two years, one was ten years, and another one was whatever, eight years. So, um, so it takes a long time, especially if you're trying to change an industry because that's generally about if you think when computers were introduced they were going to change everything. And, uh, and then nothing really happened, and then 10 years later, they did change everything. And so there's that great quote that says, technology is often overestimated initially and underestimated long term. And I think that's a good, that's a good kind of guide for what's going to happen. Um, relative to IPOs, uh, you know, I agree with, uh, uh, with what Michael was saying, what uh, Sean was saying, that, that um, you know, I, my sense is that Basically, you know, IPOs are really just about a way to realize value generally, and you can realize value a lot of different ways. Being public today, the cost of being public, I mean, you know, Sarbanes Oxley and other public expenses for us are pushing eight to nine million now. So, you know, when you look at that, you say if you were private, you avoid eight to nine million dollars. But we have to sell a lot of, a lot of software to make eight or nine million dollars to the bottom line. So you really start to look at that, and then you add attending analyst conferences and dealing with that and that whole infrastructure. And I think it's why you know a lot of people are really evaluating that. Surely the days of small companies being public make no sense anymore. So you have to have a certain amount of scale. Then the other reason to be public is if your strategy is one of acquisitions and you want you know a cheap way to buy things. You know, if you've got a highly valued public stock and you can use stock to buy things, that makes sense. Um, but again, in the scheme of things, I think, you know, it's going to be tougher to be public and there's going to be less public companies in the future um, for those reasons. Thank you. Jeff, did you have your hand up? No? Sorry. Right. Well, uh, just real quick, uh, Glenn, what you just said, uh, if my memory serves me, about uh, you're not interested in a company that has an exit plan or strategy uh, runs contrary to all the stuff you read in the books about business plans and writing presentations and so forth. I mean, most it, it, entrepreneurs are told investors want to know what your exit is. Well, I think um, you know investors want to know that there's an exit strategy after you're successful. And remember, most business plans, I mean, the number of business plans I get a week and the number that I even read, you know, I mean, that number is a pretty serious drop-off. So most business plans don't work. Most good ideas, you know, you present, you know, somebody with a good idea, they know in a minute whether it makes sense or not, you know. Big market, targeted service, this makes sense and everybody needs it. So, um, you know, my concern is when someone comes in and they're focused on the exit strategy as opposed to building value in the business, that's really the concern. You know, it was probably maybe an overstatement to say you don't need any exit strategy. Eventually, if you have an investor, 
they may want to exit, but increasingly investors say, look, we don't ever have to exit if we're throwing off a lot of cash. Um, why do we want to exit? Just let, let the thing throw off cash. You've got great recurring revenue. You know, at all scripts, 70 percent, 71 percent of our revenue is recurring. So, you know, people seem to really, at least some people really like that, the model that we built. And I think if you look at the software as a service models out there, people say, this is great, you know, Salesforce.com, you start using it, it's really hard to get off it. And for the monthly payment, you, to go out and buy and replace that whole infrastructure, it's really tough. So, you know, they basically get a customer for life. And so I think that model is very good. They don't need an exit strategy. They can exit all they want, you know, in terms of cash and in terms of selling their stock over a period of time. Yes? Can you talk a little bit about, uh, just briefly, about the current challenges that, that each of you face in your respective businesses with respect to the uncertain business climate uh, in terms of trying to plan, business plan, and reinvest in your businesses uh, in light of what's going on in Europe and, and the gridlock in Washington uh, with respect to the fiscal flow? I've got a real immediate question. What are the tax rates going to be on January 1st? Because we have to program. Uh, and, and I can tell you that when you take too little from employees and you have to figure out how to get their money later, it's really hard. And when you take too much, the phones light up. Uh, so, and you know, we have to do that across seven or eight environments in a, you know, in a, in a money center security way. So it's not like I got two guys in the room just changing the database, right? We have to test and plan and drive. And so, we're getting very, very close to our own cliff where we're going to make a decision what the tax rates are going to be on January 1st anyways. Um, and so... So you decide. We decide. Okay, yeah. so now that I know, yeah. that's a good yeah. thing to know. We just got to figure out how to correct it later. Uh, so, but, but it really creates all sorts of uncertainty around your business. It takes away uh, a lot of resources, both in the short term and the long term, uh, because we're going to have to jump and we're going to have to stop doing whatever it is we want to do to grow our business to just be able to run our business. And, you know, on the one hand, that's very frustrating. Uh, on the other hand, this uncertainty is also great for our business because the fact that everything is changing scares a lot of small businesses and those four and five into saying, I can't do this myself anymore. I need to go to these guys because they'll figure it out. So there, there's sort of two sides to that. Um, but I also think the other broader question that we face is just, uh, you know, we serve a segment of the economy that creates all the jobs, small businesses. And the tougher the environment for small businesses to operate, to get funded, to grow their business, and to expand, uh, the greater we have a chance of turnover. And the one thing we have in our business when you really want to grow that business is every time you lose a customer in the software as a service annuity base, you have to sell one just to stay neutral. And so if you're going to lose a bunch of your customers because the economic environment puts them out of business, um, it's really expensive to grow and it's hard to grow. Uh, and so those are just a few of the pieces we have, but, but obviously there's real pressure in the near term on this one. Are you a, are you a leading indicator or concurrent or w what is going on with uh, new hires? Because you're seeing it literally from payrolls. It, it, so we, we actually see a little bit different than what maybe the popular press is showing. I mean, our data, we have 40,000 small business customers across the country. We look just like the Electoral College in terms of our distribution. And year over year, we're paying fewer people. And the average paycheck is down a little bit. Uh, and it has been bouncing along the bottom uh, negative for the last couple of years. And I think if you talk to small businesses, you hear they're struggling, they're struggling to grow. Uh, there certainly are some that are growing, but the vast majority are, are, are not. And I think on the positive side, there's been so many changes in technology, Salesforce, mobile apps and things, that small businesses are able to grow their revenues at 2 to 3%, but they don't need to add the employees the way they used to because they're so much more productive. And so they're not adding back the employees, yet the owners of those businesses are, are sort of flat to slightly more profitable than they were. Uh, but we're not seeing the growth that's driving jobs yet. So back, back to the gentleman's question, dealing with uncertainty. Jim? So, um, so I'd say from, from our perspective, we certainly keep an eye on um, what our client, uh, broadly speaking, are uh, thinking and uh, how their planning is going. And, the degree of hesitancy in spending budgets and so forth. But um, I don't think that one should get, in our space at least, should get too carried away with that because there are uh, 
there are two important markets that we serve where the rates of growth are pretty dramatic, and maybe in part are dramatic because of the, the financial realities of the world today. And those two components would be the rate of growth of e-commerce spending, right, which is growing at 15%. And if you look at apples to apples compared to what's going on at retail, it's growing at about five times as fast as uh, consumer spending is growing in, you know, in the physical world. So there's a massive channel shift going on, which is good for us. So we can't ignore that reality. The other reality, similarly, is with advertising spending. So you now have digital advertising in the United States is about a $32, $33 billion a year business. It's almost equivalent of a half of what television spending is. It's still growing at 15%. Whereas all measured media is growing at about 2%. So, you know, dramatically faster growth there. That's another market that we serve. So we have to be very careful that, that if, if, we're, if we're having to develop new products, we've got to be really careful that we don't uh, cut back on that investment spending, which is important for our future, even though the overall economy might be, uh, you know, might be sluggish, you know, or, or, uh, or problematic. And just to make matters more complicated on top of all of that, <coughs> You have now a, a fragmentation of um, media consumption here in the U.S. actually around the world that is really causing some angst and some opportunity. So you've got um, smartphones, there are 20 million of these things out there today. Uh, you've got 45 million tablets. Both those numbers will be much higher once the holiday shopping season is over. And th those devices are pulling um, activity from television, uh, they're pulling it from print, and they're certainly pulling it from the fixed internet. And we in our business have to be able to measure how these audiences are consuming content across these platforms and do it uh, at scale. So the world of tomorrow is not going to be measuring uh, the, the, these media patterns with 20,000 households. It's going to be measuring them with millions. That's the only way you'll get the duplication and so forth. So, so long answer, but what we gotta be really careful that we don't um, underinvest in all of these products that are necessary in the markets that we have that are growing while we still keep an eye on, uh, you know, on what the overall economy is. Glenn, dealing with uncertainty? Sure, uh, well, first of all, yeah, I think, Jan, you're in a great business, and, uh, you know, our view is mobility changes everything. So, you know, as we see, uh, you know, phones are gonna be, what, phones and small tablets, you know, the post-iPad generation of tablets is gonna fundamentally change everything we do. So, and whether it be education, which is untapped, whether it be, um, healthcare, which we're right in the middle of, so everything we're doing has mobility in mind. And uh, if you see how young people manage their lives, it's all about their phone. In fact, you know, ask young people about watches, and you know, they're clueless why someone would wear a watch. Um, it's just it's a fascinating thing. So watches, the only reason that people wear them now that are young is for decorative purposes, but not to tell the time because they realize there's a better way to do that. Relative to uncertainty, we're, we're in an interesting role. Our international business is growing. We're in Australia. Generally, we're in Singapore. We're in uh, the UK, so generally English-speaking countries. And the nice thing about our primary business, healthcare, is that every country has the same challenges, and that is it costs too much, and the quality isn't there. There's no way to measure it. So as we extend that, um, to cover the entire continuum of care. One, mobility becomes important because managed care is really not about someone else managing your care, it's about you managing your care. And having a device that virtually everybody has will allow you to better monitor and manage your care. There's also, if you Google this, you know, the estimates are 10 years, 10 billion connected devices. So what that means is we'll all be wearing devices again if you want to see what's happening, you know, go to 18 to 21 or 18 to 29, and more and more of them are wearing Fitbits or other devices that help them manage their bodies, tell them what's going on, 
and these devices generate lots of data that physicians and other folks want to use. So we see that, um, you know, we see that as a big trend. In terms of overall uncertainty, um, ultimately we think uncertainty works well for the United States because there's less uncertainty here. So the more terrorism and uncertainty, whether it be in Europe or around the rest of the world, the more money will flock here. We think ultimately management, uh, manufacturing, as it gets more and more automated, um, can be wherever you want it to be. Labor costs become less of an issue. So um, that becomes uh, another reason to be here. And when you look at the forecast, because the US not only becomes energy independent, but we become a net energy exporter, we actually are fairly bullish on what's going to happen here. I think it's also helped the election uh, you know, was helpful from the standpoint of as a second term presidency, you know, if you look at the mandate, the mandate really says all of you get something done and everybody feels at risk and challenged and hopefully we move to the middle where things do get done. So, you know, we're, we're hopeful that at least for 18 months uh, before the next cycle of election that everybody's focused on getting some fundamental things done. And uh, so, you know, we're, we're reasonably optimistic about where things are. Last thing I'd say is unemployment is a structural issue. It's not Republican or Democratic, it's structural. You know, there's, there's a great quote I have behind my desk, and it says, uh, in the future, the factory in the future will have uh, one man and one dog. And uh, the man is there to feed the dog, and the dog is there to make sure the man doesn't touch anything. And, uh, you know, really, that doesn't speak well to large employment of lots of people who aren't very highly skilled and educated. So it's a challenge we have here. It's going to get worse and not better. The best thing we have in the U.S. is the fact that our natural uh, population expansion rate is relatively low. And that's the only thing that may help us out of that. So that's, that's kind of our sense. Thank you. More questions? Thank you all very much. And to our panel, Jan Fulgoni, Michael Alter, Glenn Tolman, thank you.